Let me just add this to that reading. I'm not, I, not to add to what was said there. Simply to add to our understanding of it. Any person in that kind of sin who repents of it and receives Christ's new life, she did die without anyone throwing stones at her. And she rose the newness of life or she never could have gone out and sinned no more. So that's a very interesting commentary on that story. The woman that left that scene did not leave the way she was brought there. And I have another question about that story. I never heard of a woman committing adultery by herself. So I'm wondering what else was going on there. And where, where was that person? I don't think they brought that person in there. But he should have been there too. Maybe he could have experienced the same thing. And I wonder something else. Sometimes in the courts of this land, when there are accusers, the accuser at, at the end of everything turns out to be the person that was the guilty one. And I wonder if the one who's guilty of that adultery was also present with those who were accusing her. But be that as it may, we don't know that. That woman left different from what she came. And you and I can you and I can go and sin no more. That's a beautiful story. That's a beautiful thought. And before I came here to Utah, these brothers in this congregation sent me a few suggestions for some messages that they thought would be appropriate for this week. And what we have tonight is one of those suggestions. And uh, so we ask the Lord to help us to share these thoughts tonight with this precious congregation. Two people can do the same thing. That is, they can do the same religious thing. Two people can do the same thing. Yet the one may be doing it with a spiritual heart. And the other only out of religious obligation. For one, doing that holy or right thing might be an experience of true worship and for the other it may be merely completing some expected work that that person felt obligated to do. Is this not what we find in that offering way back there in chapter 4 of Genesis that was brought by Cain and by Abel? They brought their gifts to God the gifts that they brought would probably have been all right. I've heard people say already that Cain's gift was not accepted because it was not a blood offering. I don't think that that is true because God accepted the first fruits of your land. In fact, the Jewish people were obligated to bring the first fruits to God. It was not wrong to bring the product of your labor. It was not wrong to bring the fruits of your land. It was not wrong to bring what your land produced to God. He asked for that. And he accepted that. He gave part of temple worship. But something else was wrong there. Though these two young men brought gifts, and though the gift itself would probably have been acceptable to God from both, from both of them, but Abel offered his sacrifice by faith, and Cain did not. Abel's heart was pure. The Bible says it was righteous in Hebrews chapter 11. And we know that Cain's was not. God told him that sin was lying at the door. And a sinner can worship God. There's nothing wrong with a sinner coming before God. The door is open for a sinner to come into the presence of God. We just read that tonight in John chapter 8. There's nothing wrong with a sinner coming to God. but not the way Cain, Cain came to God. The Bible says 
that he was ungodly. Well, you can say to me, well, Brother Dale, every sinner is ungodly. What else, to, what else do you expect of Cain? But when a sinner comes to God with the right attitude like that lady did, they don't respond to God the way Cain did. Cain, where's your brother? Sabe? I have no idea. I have nothing to do with it. Did, did, am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to keep tabs on him? I don't follow his GPS. Something was wrong. Something was very wrong. And in that attitude and that spirit, he did it. He was, he was doing his religious duties of bringing an offering to God and, and then was wroth because it was unaccepted. Because his offering was unaccepted. If Cain would have had a broken heart, his offering would have been as accepting as what Abel's was. But there was no faith there. Sin was lying at the door. He went through the religious motions, but his heart was far from a holy God. And this drama has been reenacted many, many times since then. Many people have gone through some kind of religious experience, completed their responsibilities in the church or in their religious settings, Something is wrong. It really did not please the Lord. And how is it in my own life? Looking at myself. Is my attempt to approach God motivated by love and by faith? Or by a sense of need for His mercy and grace? Is it because I want to know Him? To please Him? To serve Him? To experience His love? and reciprocate that to others? Or do I practice what I was taught to do and am expected to do? Now to put some something alive in that introduction and give you something that you can understand a little better, I'll tell you this, that we live in Costa Rica and we thought of starting a church in a little village up in the mountain so my wife and I would visit that community. We had a little vehicle there, and we were leaving the village one time to plan to return to our home after we'd done some visiting there. And saw a lady walking down the street with a young young child with her. We stopped to ask if she'd like to have a ride. She got into the vehicle. And as we were riding along, I asked her a question. I said, do you mind, lady, if I just ask you a quick I didn't know who she was. But I said, may I assume, by looking at you and meeting you here in town, could I assume that you're a Catholic girl? She said, yes, I am. And she was very polite about that. She was very open about it. So I felt, well, let's take a chance and ask her another question. I said, are you a Catholic because you read your Bibles, you studied what the Bible teaches, and you felt that that may, way of expression and access to God was a clear representation of a church according to the Bible teaching of anything that you could find. Did you study your Bible and feel that was the right choice to make? I'm, I want to do it that way. Is that how you did it? Or were you simply kind of led that way for ever since you were young without really investigating anything else, without really studying for yourself? She said, she said no sir, I, I never studied for myself. She said, this is what I was taught to do. She said, I had a Bible one time, but no one ever told me how to understand it. I didn't know what to do with it. I asked her, would you like to understand what the Bible says? She said, I would like for someone to help me understand the Bible. And so we arranged for that. And this lady is a member of our congregation today, where we live, and her husband. But I heard an expression last week that really impressed me. And I thought it might be appropriate to share it here tonight. Some lady was giving her testimony and she said, the only thing I ever had in life was cradle Christianity. Do you know what she meant when she said cradle Christianity? She meant it's all I ever knew. It was kind of uh, there and it was kind of around me. It was whatever else was doing. It's what the family had in mind and it's what we attended to. And so I just kind of found myself there too. 
Here I am. Now I'm part of it. And that may not be altogether wrong. But we need more than cradle Christianity. We need more than to be baptized in the case of age as a baby. We must make some personal decisions. We must come to know God personally. And our religious experience must be more than just something that we were taught to do and told how to do it. It must be something that's born in our hearts. The Spanish people say, no, no me nothing. Which means, it might be born in you, but it was not yet born in me. So I can't really do it because it's not in me. But it can be born in us. And that lady that was taken in adultery that you heard about the night in that reading, it did, it, it, no, let not see ya. It wasn't born in her to live a godly life, to live a holy life, to go and sin no more. The only thing she didn't do was sin. That's the only thing a sinner can do. A sinner is not a sinner because he sins. But rather sins because he's a sinner. That's all a sinner can do. We understand that. But Jesus gave her some other equipment. He gave her some hope. He gave her new life. And she was able to go and sin no more. So I wanted to tell you this story about this sister that we have in our church. We need more than a cradle religion. I realize it's convenient for us to do what everyone else around us is doing. It kind of fits in, flows with the current. There's not a whole lot of opposition to that. We don't have to do a whole lot of original thinking. It can just take us the way we're going. And we kind of flow with it. I understand that. But I want to I want to explain to you two models tonight that are of concern to me, they're of concern to God, they should be of concern to us. And then from these two models, I want to show you what the Bible has to say about this whole matter. Two people coming to the same Christian activity and, ex and ex what they're doing there, and one with one motive and one with another, and God sees this, God understands it. What is he seeing in my life tonight? I'm going to give you the model of a state church government, where we have a government, a political territory, we have a certain amount of area here, the footprint of the state is here over this terrain, over this population, over this geography, and then we come and put the footprint of the church right on top of that. So everyone that's in this, in this geographic area, they're all part of the same thing. And to make that practical for you, we live in Costa Rica. Costa Rica has a state church government. The whole country is very closely related with the Catholic Church. You need to be a Catholic to be president of the country. It's awfully hard to be elected if you're not. If you're not a Catholic, your wedding does not count in a church. No church can perform a wedding ceremony to be recognized by the state. You have to have some state official do it, lawyer, do it for you. So to be acceptable, a church can't do it. If you are a Catholic, your baptism certificate is worth a birth certificate. If you're not, your baptism certificate means nothing. Though it's very accurate, has the dates and everything perfectly done and signed by people responsible, doesn't count. It's a state church government, and that can go on. We can talk more about that. What happens in the state church government is that when children are born, they're born into a, a geographic country and they have a citizenship nationally. At the same time, they're immediately citizens and part of the established church group that's governing the country. So by birth, you're Catholic. Eight days of age, and you're in. Twelve years of age, con confirmation. And so soon, everyone's part of it. In the center of every town, there's a large cathedral. There's a grass lawn in front of that cathedral. Everyone in that whole geographic area is part of that, comes to that temple, comes to that cathedral, comes to that church. That's the, way, that's the way a state church government works. And in many state church governments, if someone's in that same geography, that's not part of that same footprint, not part of that same identification of the faith, then there can be trouble there. 
even persecution, and even death. And that has happened many times in the past. So I'm introducing this model. What's it like to live, grow up as a child, and you have a cradle religion from the very first day? But I want to change that model and give you another one. This one also is equally serious. This one also is equally wrong. There are places in the world, religious groups of people have gone. This has happened in Belize, it's happened in Paraguay, it's happened in Bolivia, it's happened in Canada, it's happened in Mexico, it's happened in several places. They buy up because they have enough money, they buy up large sections of land and establish a colony there in this geographic territory. And basically only they live there. And when they live there, and of course they expect everyone that's in there is practicing the same religious ideals that they have with their spouse. It's so constantly their children being born in that setting. Some of those do not baptize at eight days of age. But the baptism is by <coughs> tradition. When you get to a certain age, it's expected, understood, all, all people that age will be baptized and become part of this ever-growing ever unit. Religious group that's inside this colony. And in settings like that, it happens very, very frequently that people are doing religious things, quoting religious phrases, hearing religious meetings and teachings, but living rotten defiled and perverted lives. There's not that freedom to live for Christ. There's not that purity to go and sin no more. There's not that power of the life to, to live in obedience to God's will. There's not power there to take care of this pride and this fleshy selfishness that we have in us. And so there's anger in the home and on the job. And though I'm married to one woman, my eyes are checking out another one. And no power to deal with that. I said we had this religion. But to me it's dead works. A works religion. And that is a problem that we want to address tonight. This is not the way Christ is building his church. He's building his church by going through all the earth with his word, going through all the world with his message, going through all the world with his truth. Say it another way, going through all the world with his life and offering that life to people. And one by one individually they make decisions, they make choices. I want to identify with Jesus and with his truth, with his word and with his people. I want to do that. And wherever that happens, little collections, groups of people, two or three or five or seven, gathered together, and where two or three are gathered together in his name, there's Christ in the midst of them. And this is the little light that begins to shine in that dark place, and the others around them maybe I've never heard and understood so far. But they see those lives, and they see the unity, and they see the love that flows between the brothers, and they say, we need that for ourselves. And so, souls are added to that. And that's a model we use in Costa Rica to start new churches. In other places all around the world, that's the way it is done. That's Christ's model. So my question tonight is, do I have a living and obedient faith, or is mine merely a works religion? That's the title of the message tonight. Is mine a works religion? I'd like to read several texts to you from the Bible. And these texts will help explain what I have said so far, but I'm beginning here in Matthew 23, in verse 5, and Jesus is speaking here. Let's listen to his words. And he's speaking about the scribes of the Pharisees. And they were the religious leaders among the Jews at the time that Christ was here teaching, living as a man, taking the form of a man, the son of man here in this earth. And as he talks about these people, 
He has this to say about this to say about them in verse five. But all their works they do for to be seen on men. They make broad their phylacteries, and enlarge their borders of their garments, and love the uppermost robes and at the feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets. They be called by men rabbi rabbi. Their works they do to be seen of men. It's serious. It's a serious matter. Let's go back further into our Bibles to Titus chapter 1. I'd like to read here verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Though the profession is there, outwardly it sounds good. Outwardly it looks okay. The words are right. The practice is more or less what is expected of them. They do the things they need to do. But something's wrong inside. That's what he's saying here. A, 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 an outward works religion, perhaps. And then in chapter 9 of Hebrews, and I gave this reference wrong last night, I said chapter 7, it was chapter 9, and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And these works that we do to appease, to impress, <laughs> to please men, to receive the glory of men, to fit in with the crowd, to go with the current, to conveniently harmonize ourselves with the way the motion is moving around us, those works are dead works. And those dead works, this is going to surprise you, but please listen, we'll explain it tonight. Those dead works might be right things to do. Another person might have done the exact same thing that I'm doing. For me, it's a dead work. For them, it was, it was expressed of living faith. Some of them have done that and got no spiritual benefit out of it at all. Where some of them have been blessed tremendously by the same thing. Now, I, used to, I used this illustration earlier in the week. I'll just say it again because some of you didn't hear it. But I might be sitting here with a hymn book and singing a hymn. And somebody beside me might have the same book open to the same song and be singing the same thing I'm singing. And that person's heart might be enthralled with the message and the very presence of God singing this hymn and his heart is beating with the words of the hymn writer and he's happy to be sharing these thoughts to God and there's an odor of incense that rises to God from the voice and the heart of the person who's singing and I'm sitting there singing also. And maybe I'm singing better than that person is. And maybe I know music better than that person does. So maybe I'm singing who knows what. Tenor alto, soprano, or bass. But attitude and spirit is out of harmony with God. Maybe I'm trying to show off about how well I can uh, who knows what I'm doing. And there's nothing wrong with singing the song. But for that person it's a living expression of faith in God's blessings upon it for me it's a dead work. Though a good work, but for me dead. So when I'm talking about a works religion, is mine a works religion? We're thinking about that. We're asking ourselves those questions. These texts might come into perspective a bit better for us, the three verses that I read. If we would consider that in the New Testament of your Bibles, there are three kinds of works found there. If I would explain these three works to you, it might help you. And I'm going to start off with something the Bible talks about a good bit, good works. We could call them gospel works. We could call them the, 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 the fruit of a holy life. We could talk about the testimony that comes from a godly person. We could talk about the lantern that has a lamp, the light in it. And that light is shining. And that light is a testimony of union with God. There's oil in that lamp. It's making you a light. It's a testimony. It's a testimony for Jesus. These are good works. 
And Jesus talked about that. In the Sermon of the Mount, the chapter 5, Matthew 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. Those are good works. And, and the Bible talks much about that. And any person who is born of the Spirit of God is living a godly life and is obedient to the Lord and living in humility and unity and peace with others. There's a tremendous blessing comes from a life like that. It's a great joy to be married to a spouse like that. It's a great blessing to have a father or mother like that. It's a great blessing for parents and grandparents to have children and grandchildren like that. It's a very happy home. It's a very blessed Christian community when we have these good works. Not to show off. Not to please men. Not to be seen of men. Not because we have to. Not because we're under some kind of religious obligation. But there's fruit there. Maybe I can explain it to you in simple terms if I use this illustration. Some scientists were impressed with the ability of a weaver bird to weave their nest. A weaver bird is very small and their nest is very delicate. It, it almost looks like it was crocheted. And there is a kind of knitting or crocheting that's even finer than that. And they use the finest of dresses and they weave this thing such a way that looks like it was done on a loom. And oftentimes they hang these little nests on orange trees. I've seen them there. And they make this nest and they leave a hole on one side of it. And they make a little sleeve that comes out from there and that's open on the end. And the weaver bird goes in through that little sleeve and she puts her eggs in there and takes care of her little birdies in there. And it's impressive to see this work of art that a bird does with their beak and with their with their little claws. It's professionally done. A bird did it. So they took a female bird. Instead of allowing it to be raised by the mother in the nest, they took the egg and put it in a glass dish, in a glass cage. And that thing hatched after it was warmed and everything was taken care of, they fed it by hand. This thing grew to adulthood. They made it with another bird, kept it inside that cage. She's going to build a nest because there's nothing to build it with. She's inside the glass. So she laid her eggs in the corner of the glass. When the eggs hatched, the birds were raised artificially without ever seeing creation, the apple doors inside this glass. They did that for three generations. When the third generation was hatched, they let the female bird go at mating time. Though she never saw a nest in her life, and never lived in one, and hadn't for several generations, she immediately went out and found the finest grass that she could find, and made a nest as perfectly beautiful as any weaver bird has ever made it. And why did she do that? Because it was in her to do it. The life was in her. The nature was in her. Only good could come out. That's all that was in there. And what was in came out. That's the way Christians live. God did something here. God burst something in our heart. God put some truth into our life. He has given us a tremendous spiritual blessing. And, and it, it comes out of us. And why does it come out of us? Because he put it in there. And when the Bible says we're born again by the word of God that live within the body forever, it means that this holy truth takes root in here and brings forth fruit that way. And those are good works. Now, we remember it doesn't ask for any prizes. That we remember it doesn't ask for anyone to come and take a video of what he's doing. But we remember it doesn't show up, doesn't announce and put it on Facebook or advertise it on Amazon. But that we were turning out a perfect production. And do it, they do it every time. That's what Christians live. That's not dead works. So the Bible talks about good works. I have many references here, and I should take your time to have you read all those verses. But I will say this to you about those good works that glorify God. 
we will be judged by that. God says, you know, Dale, you can preach it. You know how to explain it. You, you have been, you've been able in your past to c convince somebody it was contrary to it, was of a contrary persuasion, and you had the, you were able to do that. But, but, but Dale, I'm not, that's not what I'm looking for, Dale. I, I just want one thing. I want to see if it's, if, if that's coming out of your life. I want to see if you're living it. I want to see, I'd like to ask your wife what she thinks about this. You have four living children, I'd like to know what they say, what, their, what your testimony is. I'd like to get down to your neighbors where you live in Costa Rica and talk to some of your neighbors and see if they see the same thing in your life that you're preaching about in Utah. That's where the rubber hits the road. What's coming out of the light? What's the testimony? What is the fruit on the tree? What is the light in the lantern? Is there good, are there good works there? So, there are good works in the Bible. There are evil works in the Bible. Sometimes those evil works are called works of darkness. Sometimes it's called doers of evil or workers of evil or workers of iniquity. It doesn't always say evil works, though that phrase is there several times in the New Testament. But you know what evil works are. Works that are against God, against His glory, against His holiness, against His purity, against His established laws. It's an evil work to violate a neighbor's wife. It's an evil work to take what doesn't belong to us. I had a little interesting test when I was very young. I was walking through the hallway of our high school. It was a public high school. And uh, back at that time, you know, back in the late 50s, 1960, 61, in those years, a dollar bill was worth far more money than it's worth today. And I was walking along the hallway there, and no one was around. I looked there, and I saw something in front of me. And there was a dollar bill lying there on the, on the, on the floor in the, in the hallway. And I picked this up, and here's the dollar bill. I found it all by myself. What do you do with this dollar bill? So at the end of that hallway was the principal's office. I went in there, and I was a little short. And I couldn't look up over the top of the counter. And somebody came, to the, came up to me there at the... Uh, and said, what could we do for you? And I said, well, I don't know, but I found this. I don't know if somebody lost this. Uh, maybe, you, maybe someone needs this. And the very kind lady said, well, well, well it's very nice of you to bring that in there. She said, I'm going to put it right here in the shelf. She said, I'm going to have it here for one week. I want you to wait one week. If no one comes and gets that, you come back in here. If it's still here, I'm going to give it to you, she said. Oh, that week took an awful long time to go by. But at the end of that week, I got that dollar bill. But people, not everyone does that. We can take things that don't belong to us. There are all kinds of evil works. Somebody can be doing a very right thing and it's an evil work. You can't expect pride to do good works. Pride can only do evil works. Selfishness can only do evil works. We're so good at showing them off. We're so good at parading our capacities. We're so good at wanting and seeking the glory and honor of men. We're so good at that. That's evil. Christ didn't do that. And when the king said, I, I'm going to see this lowly man of Galilee because they tell me he works miracles. I was going to do something. I was Herod. Christ didn't even speak. He saw him do no miracles. This was no time to have his picture put on the front page of the Jerusalem Times. And he did not comply with that king's requirement. Because he does not strive nor cry nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. He's meek and lowly of heart. And we should learn of him. And so they're good works and they're evil works. Now this could be very, very long, but there's a third kind of works. There are dead works. I'd like to just show that to you, if you allow me to take a little time and show you that part of it. Dead works. James says time and time again that faith without works is dead. And that is 
true. But listen to this. Works done without living faith are also dead. Hebrews chapter, chapter 6, verse 1. <coughs> dead works. What are dead works? Verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and the faith towards God. See, dead works are something we, should, we must repent of. It says it here. We're not going to, he, he's trying to take these Hebrews on to perfection. Helping them grow spiritually, not just continually hearing the same message and down here in the same elementary kindergarten. He wants them to go on and learn to, to eat meat and not just drink milk, as he says at the end of chapter 5. So he wants to take them on and build upon this foundation and not just keep on doing the foundation. Now, these young men sitting up in the front row, I stopped by where they were working the other day and they're putting a foundation in there. And so supposing I go back a week later and they're working in the foundation. And I go back a month later and they're working in the foundation. And the, the contractor they're working for comes back and sees that they're still doing this foundation. So yesterday, they finished the deck. The flooring. Today, they start putting walls up. We can't be doing the foundation every day. Is that right, Jeremy? You agree with that, J-Tag? T, you got, you got that? Uh, that's one thing you take along home, right? At least you got that much. You can't do the foundation all the time. But one of the things we have to put in the foundation, if we're going to have a so solid building for Christ, is we must repent of the dead works. So he calls it that here. He called it the same thing in chapter 9, which I've already read to you in verse 14, when he said, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And this is an interesting verse because he's saying here that these people, they have enough of religious knowledge, and here's what they're doing. Their conscience has bothered them because they know what's going on in here. And though they want to abide in that, they want to appear to be holy before all men, and they want to have the praise of men, and they want to be seen of men, Yet they know that down there here something is seriously wrong and the conscience is there stabbing them with this reality. It's not right. It's not right. You're not right. So what do they do to appease that? Religious works. Make some of you talking about a battle, read the Bible for a while. Maybe go for a period of time with, without the uh, eating some favorite kind of food. Do some kind of religious exercise, some kind of religious practice, some kind of religious favoritism to try to appease this conscience, calm this thing down, get it quiet so it's not molesting me. It's dead works. It doesn't help. It doesn't change me. It doesn't allow me to go out and sin no more. It doesn't do that to me. I was, I was bad after I did it as it was before I started it. I was, I was guilty as I was before. I, was, I, I had the same propensity to the wrong that I had beforehand. Though I was doing these religious duties. And I'm not interested in criticizing what I'm going to say next. But supposing my wife would come to me in all sincerity and say to me, you know, Daddy, I, uh, you, you know the trouble I have in life. You, you know how I am in the home. You know what I'm like as a wife. You, you know some of my difficulties. Do you think of anything I can do to correct this and prove me? Do you have any suggestions for me? Suppose I would tell her, well, Suzanne, I'm going to tell you what you do. Twice a day, I want you to quote the Lord's Prayer ten times. You do that twice a day. And this might shock you what I'm going to say next, but if she would do that, quote the Lord's Prayer ten times in a row and do it twice a, a day, and do that because she wants to be close to her Father, which is in heaven, she wants to see his will done on earth as this in heaven. She wants him to meet her needs daily, whether it's a loaf of bread, or whatever her needs might be. 
She wants to take her, her debtors and she wants to forgive those who do wrong against her. She wants all power and honor and glory to be given to him and she does have the pure heart. Glory to God. Thank you for these prayers. But if she thinks about this much repeating, her very much speaking, she's going to be proved in the thing that's caused her difficulty. Dead works. It's not going to work. And so their dead works. I will talk about that a bit more. Jesus said that the church at Sardis was dead. Why did he say that? As the book of Revelation chapter 3, the first set of verses there, talk about the letter that Christ wrote to the church at Sardis. He said that they were dead. Why were they dead? What do you mean dead? There was no funeral there. They were busy. They had religious works. They had a name that marked them as an alive church. But Jesus knew the true nature of their works. He said, I know thy works. And he knows your works. And he knows mine. He knows that they're dead. He knows that I just have a works religion. I'm just doing things and getting by. I'm doing things and flowing with the crowd. I'm doing things under inertia, you know. Your car could run out of gas at the top of the hill. Inertia will get to the bottom. You go a long way. You might even pick up speed and think, hey, we're, we're done pretty good. We might make it the whole way there. But it's inertia. There's no energy there. There's no life there. There's no power there. And so we can coast for a while. What are dead works? What makes it a works religion? How would we identify such works? And I've been trying to introduce that to you. We'll just go a little further. If you're still sitting there with your seatbelt fastened, we'll see if we can take you on this journey. The Jewish Pharisees practiced a works religion. They wanted to be seen of men. They sought the glory of men. It was not wrong to do what they did, but it was wrong for them to do it because they did not do it by faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The Bible tells us that in Romans chapter 14, the very last verse of that chapter, verse 23. These Pharisees, excuse me, but listen, they added things to the holy law of God. Here, here was God's holy law, they said to themselves. Uh, Sabbath day observance. We're going to put several hundred rules here. They're going to apply now. We're going to go to practice a Sabbath day. So they did. They decided how many how many steps you could take on the Sabbath day. They, they decided how many sticks you could carry and how much those sticks should weigh. They made all kinds of laws about Sabbath day observance. They're not in here. God said, "Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy." And to do that, you have to be a holy person. You don't make a Sabbath day holy without being holy ourselves. So they added to God's law, to his holy law, wrote their own religious manual to go along with this, the Talmud. Were metic meticulous in their worship, their observance, and yet they ignored the righteousness of God. Listen to these words. This is Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is, is that they might be saved. Well, they thought they were saved, but Paul wanted to see them saved. For I bear their record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. But they didn't accept Christ. They ignored him. They called him a rabbi. They called him a Samaritan. They called him a son of fornication. They called him a Nazarene. They called him all kinds of things. But they did not accept him as the very word of God, which is what he was. But these people in their attempt 
to establish their own righteousness by their own dead works did not submit themselves to the righteousness of God and the righteousness of God is Jesus Christ and that they did not do theirs was religious pride please let me read this to you what are dead works we're trying to show you that by these practical examples this is in Luke 18 this time reading from 10 to 14 Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. The publican standing far off would not lift up so much as his eyes went to heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to, to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself should be abased. And he that humbled himself should be exalted. This Pharisee was doing a lot of good things, but they were dead works. And he says, God, I thank thee that I'm not like, that I'm not. You know, uh, it's very easy for religious people who are careful in their observance, meticulous in their practice, exacting in their understanding of the teachings of the church. And over someone who's careless about it and ignorant of it and not doing it, over somebody who's not with us in this assembly that we have, here's somebody over here, it's very easy to look down there and say, look at that, look at that, and point fingers and say, God, I thank you. Look over there. Isn't that awful? And you expect any holy thing to come out of that? Dead works is all that's there. And what that man is doing by, by praying like that and to himself, not to God, that didn't get past the ceiling. All that person is doing is exalting himself. He said, You know what? I've done pretty well. Look at this, fellas. Jesus never did that. We heard tonight that Jesus did not come into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that's the very person that Jesus went to would look for right there. That's the person. That's the person you go for right there. Jesus was called a friend of sinners. He said in publicans' houses. They were powerless, the Pharisees were. They were powerless. What do I mean by that? Just pay attention for a few minutes to you'll soon have it understood clearly. Yes, they knew how to proselyte, how to make men twofold more the children of hell than they were themselves. <coughs> Jesus said that that's what they did. <coughs> but they had nothing to offer. Listen. They had nothing to offer a sinful woman that came into a Pharisee's house one day. And Jesus was in there and she wiped, washed his feet with her tears. And this public, this Pharisee was sitting there, couldn't stand it. And wanted Jesus to get her out of here. He had nothing to offer that woman. Though he was the, the religious powerhouse of his community. But nothing to offer that woman. His religion was dead. And so were his works. Nothing to offer a wounded and dying man lying in a ditch on the road to Jericho. And a priest walks by there, and a Levite walks past there, and nothing to offer. As far as they're concerned, let him die. And a, and a Samaritan comes along. Nothing to offer a woman taking adultery. Well, listen, the book says pick up stones and throw her and kill her. That'll take care of it. Nothing to offer. So those fellows all get out of the way with their condemnation upon that dear, that dear lady. Our Lord Jesus said, I do not condemn you, but I will do this. I will to save you. I'll give you life if you go and sit no more. They had nothing to offer. They had nothing to offer a, a publican hiding up in a sycamore tree at noontime. Away from the crowds up in there, looking down to see who's passing. 
And then when he came down and Jesus went with him to his house, the Pharisees observed the whole thing and peered through the windows, peered through the window panes, and made fun of what was going on in there. And said, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. But they had nothing to offer that publican, Zacchaeus. That's what dead works are. That's what they do. That's how much they're worth. And these same people did many things that were right. It was right to memorize the law. Nothing wrong with that. Perfectly right to do that. Yet they thought they were holy. Way too holy to enter the judgment hall when they were the ones responsible for the, for the trial going on in there and for the bloody and marred vestige that appeared on the praetorium when they brought Jesus back out after he was beat to a pulp. But they would not go in there. They were too holy for that. And all the while, there was this holier-than-thou attitude. Dead works. Christ isn't that way. Last week I was preaching in a church in Arizona. A man came in there to that service in a wheelchair. I don't know if these messages are recorded. I don't know if I should say this or not. He came in in that wheelchair and his man was extremely large. He had no house to live in. He lived in his car. I guess wherever people donated him food, he had something to eat. The brother of that congregation where I was preaching had an opportunity to have a meal with him, and he was so nauseated while he was eating from this gentleman's unkempt appearance. There, there's not a hot and cold water spigot in a Cadillac car. There's no shower in there, no bathtub. And the odor that came there was so strong. And this man parked his Cadillac out there and came into the service several times. When he got off his chair, he walked with two canes. His legs were immense, big around, right before he went into his shoe. He was an extremely large man. I just have one question for you tonight. If that man would have walked in the presence of Jesus, what would Jesus have done? And do I have any excuse? Can I give any viable reason for not taking the same attitude towards him that Jesus would have taken? If I am one of his children and filled with his life and have the same mercy and have the same love, won't we try to do something for that person? They're extremely needy they are. What do you think about that? Holier than thou, none of us are holier than the rest. Dead works. That is, a works religion that attempts to obtain the righteous, a righteous favor of God by ritual, by observance, by keeping holy day, you have the word in English, holiday. Holiday comes from holy day. And people set up holy days, special days, special days of observance. In Latin America where you live, that's a very noble thing. Holy week is more observed in Costa Rica than Christmas day is. Holy Week is the holiest time of the year. You're not going to be out mowing your yard on those holy days. You're not going to be changing the roof of your house on those holy days. Easter is not observed. The Holy Week prior to Easter is observed. More business will be closed on Holy Week than on Christmas. 
Don't expect to get a bus ride. Go to a place on Holy, Holy Week. Buses are not running. The gas station is shut. Holy Week. It's probably the most unholy week of the year in Costa Rica. Yes, we're observing outwardly. Yes, we are setting aside Holy Day. And that phrase is in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's in the Bible twice. But life is rotten. And I don't know how it happens with stores being closed, but there's more liquor sold in the Holy Week than the other time. Isn't that a strange phenomenon? I can't buy milk. They know where to buy the other stuff. It's the way it is. Yet somehow, something is missing. Something very serious is missing down inside of us here. I appreciate our neighbors where we live. Yet they struggle to obtain the righteousness which is by faith. After so much religious practice, they are destined to go out from Mass, out from the confessional, out from the cathedral, and continue a life of, of this. I will do to you what you have done to me. Jesus didn't teach that. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. I will do to you what you did to me. Heavenly Lady, lady we appreciate it very much. She trusts us. I'll prove to you that she trusts us by what I'm going to say next. This neighbor lady is trapped in dead religion, in a dead works religion. They'll, uh, they'll like for that. I was taught to be this way, this way out. Here's what she told me. She said, my daughter's a girlfriend. I can't get along with the boy. I want to see him in the house, but what him in here. He crossed my path one time. I never gonna give, give him a chance to do it again. My daddy taught me that if ever a person misuses you, Makes it hard for you, embarrasses you, causes an event for you, out of your life, never again, any relationship with that person. She said, Dale, we have a tremendous problem in our home. And I think it's my fault. But this is the way I am, and there's nothing I can do about it. I appreciated the honesty. The sincerity of that dear lady. And she must have trusted us a lot or she never would have said that. But she does all the religious stuff that needs to be done. But it's all over. She's as guilty and as needy and as empty and as powerless as she ever was. And how about me? And how about you? A works religion is a dead letter religion. The fault does not lie with the law of God. The fault does not lie with the letter. I'm not sure how deeply I should take you into this. But the Bible says that the law is holy. It says it is spiritual. The Bible says it is just and good. It says that in Romans chapter 7. It's not the law's fault. But the reason why it's a dead letter to me the reason why it does not do anything in my life. The reason why I'm trying to observe it and getting nothing out of it. The reason why it's hard for me to keep on doing it. The reason why I'm wore out with this practice. When it's God's will. is this. I have the letter in front of me that tells me what to do. I have the letter in front of me that holds me responsible. But I don't have the spirit in me to empower me Enable me, give me the life that I need to carry this out. It stands there and stares at me. And I try to do it, but I'm more out with it. It's in this dead letter, don't want it. Commandments of men. Nothing to do with it. 
The problem is this. Maybe it's because I've been hurt. Maybe it's because someone mistreated me. Maybe it's because a very, very needy time in my life someone did not understand me. Maybe someone took advantage of me. And I'm locked down on it. I close the door to it. And this religion is staring me in the face. I, I can't handle it. I don't want anything to do with it. And what I need is life in my heart. What I need is peace in my heart. What I need is a broken spirit. What I need is a contrite heart. What I need is for the Spirit of God to come and take over. What I need is a baptism from above. What I need is this life be birthed in me. What I need is that heart of a weaver bird. Can you imagine a weaver bird? That weaver bird that comes out of that glass cage and goes down to the woods, woods down into the wilderness, down into the desert to find the grasses and find the little pieces to make her nest. Imagine her with her encyclopedia. Imagine her with a law book in front of her. Imagine her trying to figure this thing out and say, I've got it now, I've got to do it like this, now I've got to do it like that. And she would go crazy. But inside of her, there's life. It's written in her heart. She wants to do it. There she is, thinking nothing about it except how nice this meal is finished. And then the eggs go in there, and those little birdies are born, and I will feed them, and they will grow, and we'll have more weaver birds very soon. And she's all excited about it. And why can't I live the Christian life that way? Because I don't have in me what the weaver bird has in her. And the law stands there and stares at me. And condemns me. But I don't have that sweet spirit of Christ. I don't have that love in my heart. I don't have that joy and that power to carry it out in my life. That's what's missing. That's what I don't have. So it all looks right on the outside. I go through the motions. I learned how to get the right answers. I wear my religious garb or my religious mask, whatever the case may be, but I'm only a ceramic doll. My eyes open and close, but I'm void of life. You know what I've got to do? I've got to go to town. Go to the market, buy a trade of apples. Bring them out here to buy a bare apple tree. I take some cellophane tape and some small string and tie these apples on there so it looks like there's fruit on my bare branches. Because I cannot produce, produce any myself. So I bought a box from the state of Washington and put it in my trees out here in front of my yard in, in Utah. Because I need fruit on my branches and I need fruit in my life and it's done there so I gather some artificial fruit and put it on there somehow. You know, I I bring my lantern to the wedding and at midnight the bridegroom comes and I have my lantern just like everybody else does. But I got one problem. I don't have any oil in it. It doesn't light. I have no testimony. There's no way to see in the dark. And the door is closed. And I take it in. And I stand there and call and knock. But the wedding is going on. But I'm not included. I have a form of godliness. But I did not experience the power of it. I can quote the what the Bible says. But that truth has not yet transformed my own life. What is wrong with me? You see, a parrot can repeat the Lord's Prayer, but it does him no good. A chimpanzee can put on a suit and a tie and come and sit up straight in the pew and hold a songbook, but it'll profit him nothing. Our problem is lack of saving faith. Our problem is God it is not real in my own life. I can't make it until it's real in my own life. Yes, we have a well-documented system of belief, but we have not believed. We know what we're supposed to believe, we can't live. Our religion is something studied, but our hearts are too full, too full of ourselves. 
It reminds me of this word that God said prophetically. Jesus quoted this then later when he was on this earth. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips they do honor me, but I have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. That's all they have. It wasn't a real experience. I'm doing what I was told to do. One can have a works religion without having divine life. Without having been born from above, without the life of Christ being evident and manifest in daily life. I think you know by now as we bring this to a close tonight what the remedy is for dead works. What the remedy is for a works religion. I think we all know by now. I think we've heard enough that we can figure this out. You see, wouldn't it be better if I would start here? If I would start with this word that comes out of the very heart and mouth of God, inspired with His very life and breath. Very life and spirit of God in the message of this book, if I would read it or hear it, I speak to people that do not know how to read, so we must read clearly so they can get it because they can't read it. I served a minister in Costa Rica with a man who did not know how to read until after he was a Christian. But he knew that there was truth in this book. He heard other people read it, but he couldn't read it. And he asked God to give him the gift to be able to read one verse in the Bible. He asked God to help him. If I can just, if, if you give me the, the ability, it, it is, I don't know how, but show me how to read one verse. And he learned how to read one verse. Now where is this young lady here, Dorcas, that happened in Chichagua? That was Luis Carvajal. He was living in Chichagua when that happened. And he was all excited. He ran out of the house with his Bible. Went over to his neighbors. Read the, read the verse to him. If I would start with this word, start with what it says here, and, and with that joy and blessing of receiving it and believing it and saying, God wrote this for me. I can have this. I can experience this. This is God's will. It's His life. It's for me to do this. I can have this. And faith comes. And when faith comes by hearing the word of God, the next thing that follows is that faith always obeys God. We have that in, the, in Hebrews chapter 11, some 20 or more times. The examples of where faith moved people to obey God and do exactly what God's will was. Because faith was at work. Faith was carrying out in their lives. The result of that is holy living, a transformed life, a new creation, new creation, a new birth, a new nature, transformation, a new way to live, a new way to look at life. We must start there. Then the life of Christ, our Lord, becomes our motivation, becomes our power, becomes the pattern for our own lives. And from us, others see the testament of Christ. They see that. They notice that difference. They see that there's light in the lantern. Christ became a man like we are, so that we can become like him. Our desire is to be formed into his image, formed into the image of the likeness of Christ, to live as he did on this earth. And, and we don't do it alone because Christ is in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. He sends his Holy Spirit to make his habitation with us, to make his abode with us, is what he said in chapter 14 of John. He lives with us. But who hath believed our report? Is Christ revealing himself to us tonight? Is this the life that I need for myself? Am I willing? Am 
am I willing to ask Christ, are you, are you here in my heart? Are you taking care of me? Would you like to have access? Would you like to have the freedom? And when we said tonight that we could say yes or no, tonight we say, I have the freedom to choose, but <coughs> I, I say yes. I, I don't say no. I want to say yes. <coughs> I want to say yes to God. I want to say yes to His truth. I want to say yes to His spirit. I want to bow my heart and humble myself and say, I need this. I've not done very well doing it by myself. And there's much value in religion. I, I will admit to you that there is. There's much value in it. It's better to do the right thing than the wrong thing. Let's do it for a right motive. So it brings light to us. So it transforms us. So it fruit is formed without past, pasting the apples on. So there's light in the lamp without knocking the door at midnight and the oil in the lamp. So there's a testament of Jesus Christ. I guess I'll end with this simple Bible observation. Testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, when Rome was growing in power, Nero was emperor there. Early Christians were being slaughtered, burned to death, because they were Christians. You had a simple way out. There was a simple way to escape all the danger, all the persecution, all the suffering, all the exile. There was a simple way to, to get rid of, to get free from it. The only thing you had to do was extinguish the fire in the lantern. Blow it out. Quench the spirit. Have no testament of Jesus. And when Jonah was taken and put in exile in the Isle of Patmos, the Bible tells us in chapter 1 of Revelation that he was put there for the testimony of Jesus Christ. When those martyrs were taken and those white robes were on there and the and the revelators saw this great multitude around the throne and wondered, how did they get there? The holy answer from the angel was, these are they which have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And if the authorities would break into this building tonight, the sort of one of us into two groups, and not the ones that know how to say it on this side, and those that never learned how to say it on that side, no. But those that have the testimony of life in Christ Jesus on one side, and those that have no evidence of his life within their hearts on the other side, and you're free, you may call us. Nice, 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 to, nice to meet you tonight. Uh, have a good time. And we'll just deal with these over here. And which side would you be on? And someday, there'll be another tribunal. And another judgment. And someone else being in the decision. And the books will be open. And the Holy One will be there. And you'll be looking for one thing. Not that it works. But the testimony of Jesus Christ in your life. And of all things, dear friends and neighbors tonight, and all the dear people gathered here. Of all things, be sure that the life that you now live in the flesh, in your body, you live it by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you, and he's abiding in you and he's in control of your life. You yield to Him your time and your talents, your health and your future, your occupation. You yield to God, put that on the altar, and let Him make up your life. But it's His choice will for you. That is the testament of Jesus in your heart. I just want to invite you to consider that tonight. Would you to be willing to do a little personal examination there, and I want to do it too. And then we want to come back together, gather together again tomorrow night. And ask the Lord to keep on teaching us and blessing us. I wonder if Brother Luke is still in here. I don't see where he got to. Would you come up right here, brother, and dismiss this meeting tonight, brother?